How are you all after your lunch? I hope you managed to grab something whilst checking your emails and doing everything else. Thank you for coming back here to the Active London Conference. I'm Jeanette Kwachi. If you weren't around this morning, you know you can catch up. You've got stuff that's right there on demand that you can go back and have a look at. We've already had some really great sessions looking at COVID recovery for Londoners, looking at young Londoners, and of course, how we right here in the capital can access our leisure facilities. Coming up, coming up now, after your lunch, what you've just had, you would have seen the wonderful slide there of Claire Harvey. I'm very excited to talk to her, Paralympian, very much in my own sport of athletics. I'm pretty sure we have a lot to catch up on. It's also about, all about disability, access, and making impactful change in that space as well. Later on this afternoon, we've got a session on social influence the role of social media and how much that plays in engaging and inspiring people who are a little bit less active in London. I guess we would have seen quite a bit of that during the lockdown and during the pandemic. We'll also hear from Cormac Russell, the Managing Director of Nurture Development, on the importance of co-creation and engaging local people and issues in their needs and in their communities. A couple of things I need to remind you about. The Q&A function right there on your platform is for you. Type in your questions, collaborate, share, network. We're here to learn. This is a conference about making sure we come together, we unify and work out the best way forward of all the different strands when it comes down to being active in London. Um, we'd love to hear from you on social media. Use the hashtag Active London and of course tag at London Sport. Everything over there we're going to be picking up and pulling out and seeing what we can do better for you if you've tuned in for this. So please let us know what you're thinking. There are feedback sessions as well after every, sorry, feedback forms after every session as well. So please do write in those, talk in those, let us know what you're thinking about everything that's happening today. So hope you got some good lunch. Like I said, you got yourself a drink, a cup of tea, coffee if you need it, because we're going to move into our next session. I'm delighted to be able to welcome someone very special to this conference, uh, a Paralympic athlete, someone who has been right up there when it comes down to disability sport and an advocate, of course, for making sure that there is impactful change. I'd like to welcome Claire Harvey to the session. Hello, Claire. Hi, Jenna. Good to see you. How are you? So, I'm, I'm going to Sorry? It's okay, I was just asking how you were, but please, shoot ahead. <laughs> <laughs> just excited, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, so I'm going to talk to you a little bit today about my story and my journey to um, in getting back into sport, having acquired a disability, in the hope that it might help you think about um, how can you best connect um, and really provide a brilliant service for those with disabilities. So let me start by thinking about my journey. Um, I grew up without a disability. Um, I grew up understanding um, who I was, what mattered to me. Sport had always been a big part of my life. Um, and I definitely um, fell into sport, I would say. I grew up, my dad was a big rugby player and I grew up on the sidelines of the rugby pitch. And when my dad's team started a women's team when I was 14 years old, even though I wasn't technically a woman and old enough to play, I was determined I was going to have a go, mostly because my mum told me that whatever I did, I didn't, uh, she didn't want me to. In my career, um, I, I was a psychologist by background. I joined the prison service uh, without really an idea what that prison service meant, but I was enjoying it and I was thriving in it and I was having a great career. So picture my life doing well in rugby, playing at premiership and international level, doing well in my career, knowing who I was as a person, knowing those things that made me important and those aspects of my life that were really important to me. But what if those things change and they're out of your control? That was what happened for me in 2008. Um, I acquired my disability, an incomplete spinal cord injury. Um, and they told me at that point, having spent nine days in hospital, um, that I would never walk again. It's hard to put into words how that day felt because everything I thought that mattered to me, everything I thought that was important to me, everything I thought that made me important to society, I couldn't see anymore. 
And that was partly because I grew up in that era where we didn't talk about disability. If I saw someone with a disability, everyone walked past and pretended that there was nothing to talk about. So when I lay in that hospital bed, I had no sense of what my life could be like. I want you to think about that. How much are you comfortable thinking and talking about people who are different, people with disabilities and all kinds of difference in order to really understand what makes a service great for them? Back to that journey. I was in the hospital when the Beijing Paralympics was on and historically I'd watched the Paralympics, if I'm honest, with a bit of bless them, aren't they doing well, with a bit of pity with a bit of laughter at something I always remember seeing the people without arms or legs trying to swim and wondering what that was like and there I was being wheeled into a room literally and being told to watch the Paralympics. Now knowing that I'm a Paralympian you're probably expecting me to say that was the moment I decided that's it I'm going to be a Paralympian. Couldn't be further from the truth. There I was watching people who made everything look so easy, who were coping so well with their disability, who made everything look so effortless. And yet there I was struggling to even sit upright and imagine what my life could be. And I tell you that because in sport, particularly grassroots sport, we're so quick to talk about you could be brilliant, you could be the next this, you could be the next success story. But people join sport for all different sports of reasons and at all different points in their life. And are we really catering enough for those people who that big picture, when they're just wanting to be able to get through that next day, could really, really connect with them? So I entered this world of disability, a world I didn't know at all, and a place where I really struggled to fit. And it wasn't that I was struggling so much. You hear this talked about all the time in terms of diversity. It's not the person that struggles. It's how society around them um, responds to that. I had friends who had no idea what to say to me anymore. I had people who were awkward with language and what to do and what to say. I even had one friend who would turn up to the hospital and cry for the entire time as if in some way that was going to make me feel better. I think that's the issue. We get scared of saying and doing the wrong thing. And that fear overrides the start of a conversation that means we can actually see past our stereotypes and our limitations and our, whether they're our own limitations or whether they're our views of other people to start to unpick and make things better. As I said before, the Bernardo's box that you can see here is all I had in my head when I was laying in that hospital bed. Limitations, things I couldn't do anymore, being dependent on everybody all of a sudden. And alongside that was my self-doubt. Myself, how am I going to get back? What could this look like? All of those things that get in the way of really moving forward. But I did start to find places I fitted. But that's difficult. We all want to belong. We talk about diversity. We talk about inclusion. What we're actually talking about is people feeling like they belong. People feeling like I'm visible. I'm valued. And this service, this activity, this provision has been made with me in mind. But it's tough when you're on the outside because you always look from the outside in. I went to a have a go day and I tried lots of different disability sports and um, pretty determined I wasn't going to like any of them because I didn't want to be disabled and I didn't want, therefore, to be part of that community. Mm. And it wasn't rugby, the sport that I absolutely loved and was wedded to. But as I tried them, I realised something quite spectacular that people were waiting until you were in the sport in order to tell you how great the sport was. I tried some amazing sports, most of which I was pretty rubbish at, but it wasn't until I, I started to engage with them that they told me about what was available. Think about that for your provision for a second. You can have the most inclusive provision in the world, but if people are sitting on the outside looking for their assumptions about what it might be like and scared to come through the door. That's a pointless exercise. You need to be really explicit in how inclusive you are and how welcoming you are and help people get through that door. Because feeling other 
feeling less than, that drip feed like acid rain of difference and this doesn't work for you and you need to do something different. It eats away at people's engagement. It eats away at people's self-worth and it eats away at people's courage. So don't wait for people to come through your door. Be explicit in reaching out to those people and engaging with them in order to build their trust. That journey continued and on the very last session of the Have A Go Day, I found a sport called sitting volleyball. Basically, the stave is standing volleyball, but we sat on the floor out of my chair and the, and the net is much lower, so it's a much faster game. I absolutely loved it, but I was rubbish at it because I had a body that I didn't know how to move around and I had a sense in me that rugby was a game where you hold on to the ball and don't give it to anyone and volleyball is a game where you throw it up in the air and my brain just couldn't compute that. And therefore, I kind of engaged, but I kind of didn't. How much are we brought into a society of you have to try something and if you're not instantly good at it, then you move on to the next thing. How much are we brought into looking for the super talents really early rather than nurturing that talent and seeing where it goes? I was really lucky because of the timing, because London 2012 was coming and therefore we had the opportunity to put in a home games if we could prove that we could be competitive enough. People were willing to spend the time and spend their energy helping us be better. I wonder how much that is the case now. So I started on that journey, six of us indeed, most of whom have never played volleyball before, most of whom had acquired a disability relatively newly. And I realised at that point that, top, that talent is like a vegetable patch. You plant something in the ground and you don't see it for ages. But what makes that, that seed turn into something beautiful and strong or wither and die has very little to do with the seed. It has everything to do with how much it's nurtured and cared for. I saw a great saying yesterday that said, um, everything shines if the writing is right. So let's think about our provision. Let's think about, are we nurturing? Have we created the right lighting and environment so that everybody can really reach their own potential? Or are we doing what works for the majority or what we believe works for us because we are often so involved in sport before we get involved in setting up sport that we kind of remember that feeling? Or are we taking the time to take people where they are and take them on the journey that increases their engagement in sport rather than expect immediate engagement? So the six of us started off on this journey, 18 months to qualify to be the Paralympic team. On paper, you would never start that journey. It makes no sense at all. But we decided to see where we get to. And when I reflect back on that journey, there are some really important lessons that I wanted to share with you, both from a personal point of view, but also from an infrastructure point of view as well. I hope you can translate so the first was I needed to surround myself with positive people. I surrounded myself because my disability was new with medical professionals, all of whom had my best interests at heart, and also people who were very keen to, for me not to be put at risk, for me not to put myself in uncomfortable positions and be let down. And I realised that that was holding me back. I needed to surround myself with people who would listen to what I wanted to do rather than what they thought I should do and would help me co-design the way to get there. It sounds like you've got more of that coming later. I also realised the importance of sharing those, to help, those tips to help others to thrive. I never imagined I could drive after my accident. I can't use my legs. How on earth did that possibly happen? But one of my team, who has no legs at all, turned up in a car. So I asked her how on earth that was possible. And she told me very quickly um, that she simply um, got an assessment and used hand controls. Everything you do with your feet in your car, I now do with my hands. That 10 seconds that she didn't even have to think about opened up a world of possibilities for me. How do you create within your organisation, with your users, but also across the sector, 
the sharing of those tips that you've learned the hard way that could help others really accelerate. We also needed to realize that nothing was going to be perfect. We found a gym that worked for us geographically that we could all meet in and start to train, but it wasn't an accessible gym. Now, we could have complained. We could have told them about the Equality Act. We could have started a press frenzy about Paralympians being refused entry and all of those things. We could have done all of those things. But London 2012 was coming like a steam train and we needed to be ready for it or we were going to miss it. So we needed to find solutions and not just highlight problems. Now, for us, that meant we started off really poorly, but effectively. We would literally turn up in the gym, beep our horns, and huge, great burly guys would come and literally lift us out, lift us over our shoulders and carry us into the gym. It wasn't perfect by any stretch of the imagination. But it started to build trust. It started to break down the barriers between us. And we started to work together to imagine what might be possible. And that's now one of the most inclusive gyms in the country, I think. We often can get so frightened of not getting it right. What if we aren't, can't meet somebody's needs that it's better not to try? But actually, we miss those incremental nudges. We miss the opportunity to co-design. We miss the opportunity to make those little things better, which if we continue to do that all of the time, they soon add up. We also needed to underpin that with honest conversations. We called this get your fish out. If something wasn't working for you as a team member, um, so for example, a training time, and you were turning up at training tired or not really concentrating, then actually we weren't being our best. So we needed to have honest conversations about what worked within the limitations for us to find solutions. A bit like having a dead fish in your cupboard. If it's in there, Irrespective of whether you're talking about it or not, it starts to smell. And the longer you leave it, the worse it gets, the more it starts to infiltrate the environment. So to solve that problem, you need to get that dead fish out. You need to have that uncomfortable conversation, highlight what you don't know, highlight the barriers, and then we can start to work on the problems. But it isn't always um, plain sailing. This was us at the World Championships. We were six months into this journey and we weren't nearly ready to be at World Championships, but it was our one chance to compete with teams that we would only ever see in the Paralympics. As you can see from the pictures on, the, on, the, on my team's faces, it wasn't going so well. Volleyball is a team of a game of 25 points. Um, our average point score was four. But we weren't there to win. We weren't there to be the best. We were there to learn, to get better, to work together, to build the foundation for what was the next stage. Think about that for your organisation. Are you focused on being the best or are you focused on those incremental nudges and building the foundations, which means experiencing the lows so that you can work out how to get to the highs? I was voted the team captain, a huge honour, particularly as it was the team who voted me. But it added another level of pressure because I didn't really want to be the spokesman. I wasn't the best volleyball player. I didn't really think I had in control my own nerves and emotion, let alone worrying about the team. But I realised that somebody had to leave and I realised that it was important that I created an environment where everyone else could be their best. I realised that there were times when we needed to play to our strengths and there were times when we needed to develop our weaknesses. I think that's true for organisations and clubs and sports infrastructure as well. There were times when we need to showcase how good we are and there were times when we need to be humble and work on those areas we know we're not very good at. We also need to build better connections. We had an amazing group of people around us who helped us get to where we were. I was working full time because I had mortgage and I had children that weren't going to go away for the Paralympics. So I had to balance everything in my life. And for me, that meant going to the gym at 5.30 in the morning before I went on to work. Now, the caretaker of the gym, for him, that meant me asking him to get up at five o'clock in the morning to open the gym. He got nothing out of that. There was no immediate benefit for him. And yet he was so willing to help me. And without him, I would never have got to where I got to. Who are those people in your system? 
Who are those people who work quietly behind the scenes, who do those things that that don't get the spotlight, but are so fundamentally important to making the outcome that you're looking for? And think about, are you really giving them the praise that they need? Sport is probably the place where we see that if everyone has the same skills, it doesn't bring out the best team. If only we could translate that to the corporate world a little bit more. But actually, as the team, I realised the importance of not just recognising that, but maximising it as opposed to mitigating it. And I realised that in order to do that, I needed to build trust. I needed to build trust before I needed to interact with my team. I needed to build trust off the pitch before I asked things of them in the, in the pitch. Now, of course, that's logical. But how much of that do we do in real life? I think we treat people like vending machines. We have a tendency because we're time poor and life changes quickly to go to people only when we want something for them and to treat them like a vending machine and then go away again. That doesn't build trust. It doesn't build those relationships. It merely builds a transaction. That takes time and intentional effort. But believe me, it's well worth the journey. It also means you have to think hard about what you need right now and in the short term rather than the long term future. We had one game in the Paralympics when one of our team, her whole family, were coming from Wales to watch the game. When we drew the pool, it was obvious that that game was not one where her skill set was going to be needed. As the team captain, I had to tell her that whilst I understood that her whole family were coming to watch, she was going to be on the bench. It was an amazingly hard moment. But if I and her hadn't been brought into that trust relationship and hadn't been brought into um, what we could do together and the bigger goal, well, she's much bigger than me and she can run. So I suspect I wouldn't be here to tell the story now. How much do you want to have the appetite to work through the hard times with people as well as just celebrate the good times? We also needed to create that environment where we were focusing on our abilities and not our limitations. Not seeing what we couldn't do, but instead seeing where our strengths were. We were playing against countries for whom volleyball is a main sport, played in schools, played on a huge level, which meant we were competing with people who had a disability but had grown up playing volleyball their entire lives. We were never going to compete technically. But did we focus on that? No. Instead, we focused on what did we have or what could we have that perhaps we could do better than them. And for us, that was teamwork and our ability to work together rather than be individual strong players. I wonder what that looks like for this sector. You all have individual things that you do brilliantly. What if we genuinely work together? What if we really, rather than try to be all things to all people, genuinely collaborated? I wonder what difference we could make there. We had members of our team who joined because they loved volleyball. We had members of our team who joined because they wanted to prove to society they were worth something and they could do something with their lives. We had members of our team who frankly wanted a GB tracksuit and saw sitting volleyball as the easy route to get into that. And initially I found that quite difficult until I realised that it didn't matter why people came. I was putting my judgment about why people should be there onto other people rather than just accepting that their reason for coming was valid enough and working with that. We often don't want people to really be signed up to what we're doing, really brought into it, really see it in the same way. But we don't. It doesn't matter. What we need to do instead is listen. Listen to what matters to them. Listen to why they're engaged. Listen to what role they feel that they can play and work with that. That's particularly been true of the COVID situation. If I take my team, all of my team had different circumstances that meant their lives in COVID were hugely different. We were all in COVID. We were all in a pandemic. But I'm sure if you just speak to people around you um, at various points in your life, you'll realise that that experience and what that means can be really different. 
So let's not think about groups of people like the disabled or the black community or the LGBT community or whatever we're thinking about. Let's not think about them as big homogenous groups who have the same needs. And let's start to work at listening to individual circumstances and addressing and removing the barriers that that person is facing. When we were at the Paralympics, I'll never forget that moment of going into the stadium and 85,000 people cheering for me. I didn't know a single person there. And those Ali G meets astronaut wedding outfits, if you can remember them, that looked really big and fluffy, were actually thin and cold. So it wasn't a great day from a point of view of kind of um, well-being. But as soon as that 85,000 people started to cheer, I felt invincible. Not because I was Claire Harvey, a sitting volleyball player who was never going to get a medal um, and was there to build a foundation for the next set of Paralympics, but because of what we represented collectively. I think the sector represents something collectively too. And that means everyone involved is a role model. Everyone has someone looking up to them, someone looking to them for light in dark times or someone looking up to them to imagine what their life could be like and how things should be done. Now, that doesn't mean you need to be perfect. I always found this really strange when people would say to me, oh, you know, my child's taken up sport because of you. And I used to think, wow, if only you knew about the aspects of my life I wouldn't want you to know about. You know, if only you see my life so perfect, if only you knew reality. But that's not the point. We need to be real models. We need to show the good as well as the bad. We need to show that despite the challenges, despite the barriers, despite the conflict, we can move forward and therefore other people can too. This was us in that opening ceremony. And I think our faces, whilst I think we look like Ali, um, whilst I think we look like Charlie's angels, I think it shows on our faces that this was so much more than sport. This was feeling belonging. This was feeling visible, valued, and that I truly belonged. We were called the superhumans. Personally hated that term. You only need to see me near a spider to know how superhuman I am not. But what we were instead were people who'd been listened to, who had been thought about in design, who'd been given the right opportunities, the right support and the right access to find our place to shine. I'm just a normal person who was given that opportunity and it turned me into that worst moment in my life where frankly I wished I was dead to the best moment in my life I could ever imagine. If I can do that, then everyone can do that. But importantly, if we could create that for everyone, for those people who don't have that sense of feeling, for those people who don't have that sense of feeling valued or belonging or visible, imagine the difference we could make. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Claire. So inspirational listening to your story there. And honestly, I was in Tokyo for the Paralympic Games this year and it was just an absolute treat to be one of the only people that was allowed to go and watch and, and of course report on it. So your story just bringing back so many memories in terms of what it's like to work on the Paralympic Games. I was also out in Rio as well for the Paralympic Games there. So just listening to that and understanding how you were able to turn your adversity into something so positive is just amazing. So thank you so much for being so open and honest with us here at Active London. One thing I did want to ask you, is about the Paralympic movement. And a lot's been said about trying to inspire generations and nations with disability sport. And do you feel that it's working? Do you feel it's moving in the right direction? So I definitely feel in terms of inspiring people that it's working. I feel like you see more young people with disabilities active than probably you did 20 years ago. You know, 
that you see more um, simple things like um, now under 18 year olds who are who've lost a limb can automatically get running blades, whereas before there used to be a long process to do it. So those little things that start to make a big difference. I think what's still lacking is the infrastructure. So if you take my sport, for example, you know, I live in um, southeast England. My nearest club to me is um, 70 miles away. So that requires a level of um, ability to fund, access, get to um, the, the, the services that are available, as opposed to what I'd love to see is in every community, there's a huge range of disability sports so that kids aren't just taking up swimming or athletics because they're the two that are more accessible, but they're genuinely trying to find the sport that they love. Is access, making sure that kids have the access to things that they want to try, things they never even thought would be available to them. So that is definitely something for sure. You mentioned one thing there in your, in your talk, and that was around the fact that people need to understand that it's not about feeling sorry for Paralympians. It's not about feeling sorry for people with disability sport and understanding that they too can be elite athletes doing incredible things. But when we look in the workplace, we don't see that sometimes. That's not really reflected, is it? How, how important is that, especially in, sport, in the sports industry, that that's reflected, that people with disabilities can be just as amazing and they don't need the pity that sometimes is put towards them? It's really important. I mean, even now, you know, I, I, come, I go around travel around a lot and every day pretty much I get someone saying to me oh you're doing so well or aren't you going fast and you think wow but but it comes from a good place people don't know what to say I think and therefore they kind of get that and if you think about how disability is represented in society particularly before kind of London 2012 and the last leg and those kind of things it has always been about pity it's always been about the challenge and all of those and they, they don't go away um, but actually it's one part and if we remove those challenges then actually people can be have huge potential. And what we need to do is work with people to work out what does that look like, particularly in sport where we so often have, this is the way that we do things. This is the coaching journey. This is the athlete pathway. And actually, I know for my journey, you know, when we lifted the um, able-bodied volleyball pathway, it was like lovely, but all of us work. So we're not going to go on a whole week training camp. So let's revisit that and make, try and work on the outcome in a way that works for us. And I think that's what makes it hard for people. Coaches have to let go of their assumptions of how you do things and work with people to find a solution that's based on what they can do. What are the benefits, do you think, Claire, for having that diverse workforce and people with disabilities joining the workforce? I think it's hugely um, beneficial on a number of levels. One is probably if you have someone with a disability or you know any diversity come into your workforce, it makes you think about things in a different way because it's there in front of you all the time. And that thinking then starts to infiltrate into your design of your services, your design of how you approach things, your design of, of thinking. The other thing is, of course, the more people we have with different views, the more diverse our innovation and thinking is going to be, therefore, the better solutions we're going to have. If we keep thinking and doing the same things, we're always going to get the same outcome. But I think, it, I think it's more important than that. It also shows people that, you know, there's that saying, isn't it? You can't be what you don't see. And it shows people that there is a route for everyone into wherever they want to be, rather than thinking that they're narrowing their aspirations based on what they think is achievable. Brilliant stuff, Claire. Honestly, absolutely inspirational. And I just want to ask one last very, very quick question. That poor caretaker that had to wake up at half past five every morning to let you in the gym, did you give him a big box of chocolates to say thank you? <laughs> I did, and I, um, I, I got him front row tickets for the games and, okay. and, and we've stayed in contact ever since. So, um, But I just think we don't thank those people enough. It's true, it's true. That was brilliant. Thank you, Claire. Claire Harvey, of course, Paralympian, in, uh, just amazing all around Paralympian as well. Two sports, can I just say that as well? Volleyball and athletics. I didn't know that for sure. So thank you so much for joining us. That was absolutely brilliant.
We're going to be moving on now to the next session in about 10 minutes or so, so you've got a bit of time to grab yourself a drink. We're going to be looking at social influence and social media, that big thing that sits right with us in life these days and how it inspires less active Londoners to maybe get back into some type of fitness. So join us back here in 10 minutes or so. We'll be back here at 2 o'clock for the next session. I'll see you then.